All right, welcome to uh, the Needed Democratic Council. My name is Brittany Allison, and I am uh, very excited to be um, leading and moderating this conversation on wellness in our communities. Um, we have joining us tonight um, Scott with the city of Laverne, um, the city of San Dimas, um, and he is the newly how long have you been with the city of San Dimas Scott remind uh, me it's June 8th so just coming up on three months it's coming up on three months yeah. where he is the um director of parks and recreations and then we have Amanda who is a community service specialist for the city of Laverne um and we're we're just gonna have a little conversation about how we imagine wellness in our communities and in our cities um what uh the uh event will look like first we'll hear from Scott and he'll share a little bit about what he brings to the city of San Dimas um what they offer to community members and residents um and then also touch a little bit on what it looks like going forward and most importantly how we can all get involved, right? How we can better utilize what the city has to offer, support what the city hopes to offer, um, and, and find an avenue for us all to uh, contribute to our our wellness and our neighbors' wellness. Um, and then Amanda will follow that with a um, presentation on City of Laverne side. Um, yeah. If you have any questions please drop them in the chat box so that if it's a clarifying question, we can go ahead and interject and get that clarified. Um, if it isn't a clarifying uh, question, then we'll have a question and answer period at the end. Um, mm -hmm. But go ahead and put it in the chat box when you think about it so that we know, um, so that so that it's you know recorded. Um, and then we'll have a little Q&A after those panel discussions. Sound good, everybody? Yes. Uh, all right, Scott, go ahead and take it away. And feel free, I was lucky enough to, to read Scott's bio. I would love for you to start it with giving um, the quick rundown of what led to you coming to the city of San Dimas because it is, um, it's incredible. I'm stoked that you're here. Let me hear it. <laughs> hey, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> thank you everyone for welcoming into your, me into your meeting here. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm Scott Wasserman, the director of, currently the director of Parks and Recreation in the city of San Dimas. It's funny that you ask that, Brittany, because I have a really cool story about how I got into the profession. Um, I started off actually as a social worker and I majored in social work in Spanish. I was a bilingual social worker for LA County Department of Children and Family Services. Did that for about a year and I, I for reasons I won't go into, got just really frustrated with the system um, so I joined the Peace Corps and I ended up going to Belize of all places and my central job there um, did a lot of things when I was there, but essentially what I did was I worked with the city council to start a department of community participation, which is what we would call a department of community services. Um, that's how I got into the profession, came back to the United States, um, kind of just worked my way up through the recreation profession. And I'm in the city of San Dimas now. This is the third city in which I've been a director. Um, I really enjoy the work. That's why I keep doing it. Um, I could try to move up to the next position up. I really like doing community services. I think because it's so attached to wellness and the interaction of people with their government. Um, so that's a little bit about how I got into the profession. Um, you know, the city of San Dimas, I think any Parks and Recreation or Community Services Department, we have a central role in the wellness of the community. And we do that a lot of ways. And just to give you some perspective, if we had had this discussion in the 70s or 80s, it would be really different because back then recreation departments, we just built things. We didn't really consult the community. We might put a playground in here, we put a facility in there. Um, now what we try to do is we recognize that there are some specific goals that we're trying to achieve and some specific needs of the community that we're trying to meet. So there's a lot of community consultation involved in, we can call it a park master plan or a facilities master plan, um, pretty much in planning out all those programs and services that we wanna offer. And ideally, if you were a new city, you would do a master plan, which is where you figure out, you consult the community and figure out what kinds of services and programs you want. Then you would figure out what kinds of facilities you need to deliver those services and then you would master plan everything, which means that for the next 20 years, you have a written plan 
as to how you're gonna implement that. Um, older cities like the city of San Dimas are fun because in parks and recreation, I think there's a, there's a constant um, effort to renew what we do and to reinvent ourselves. Um, so you do have cities that, that sort of do the same thing over and over and there's nothing wrong with that. They're meeting the needs of the residents. What I find is that the needs of the residents change. Um, so every few years you do a needs assessment and they actually did that last year in the city of San Dimas before I joined the team. So when I came, I was given this needs assessment um, which was a little awkward just because we're just pulling out of COVID and then COVID comes roaring back. Um, but I'll get into the wellness aspect of what we do. Um, Brittany, before the meeting, you were talking about walkable communities, communities that have trails, communities that have bikes or uh, bike trails, walking trails, um, all of the programs and services that, that bring people together. To me, that's all quality of life. That's all wellness. And if we broadly define wellness as, um, I have some notes here, um, physical health, mental and emotional health, intellectual health, it's your social health, uh, environmental health and spiritual health, right? So that's obviously pretty broad. And if I can encapsulate what we do in a nutshell is that we try to provide uh, the programs and the facilities for residents to, to pursue a healthy and active lifestyle. So we provide, we maintain a lot of open space throughout the city. We have about 14 parks. I think it's about 177 acres. We have an 18 hole golf course. Uh, we have an equestrian facility and we have a recreation facility. It's an aquatic facility that needs a lot of TLC, uh, but we have it nevertheless. And it's very interesting that when we talk about um, wellness, I think, that's a lot of what makes people feel good, right? Is their connection to their community, their connection to their neighbors, uh, connection to nature. And those are some of the needs that we try to fill. Um, just some examples of those connection to nature. We, um, we have a lot of nature in San Dimas. I mean, we, we maintain about 10 miles of trails. You can walk those trails, you can bike the trails, you can take your horse on the trails. Um, we have the open space at all of the parks. Um, open space where you can just go and kick a ball around with your family, or we actually have recreation amenities um, that are out there for you to use. Everything from tennis courts to basketball courts. Um, we have about 14 youth sports organizations uh, that use our facilities to operate their leagues. Um, so there's a lot of wellness in there. And something else that we do that's a really big topic right now, um, we, my department manages the urban forest which are basically all of the trees um, that you see in the public rights of way on the medians in the city parks. Um, we manage all of those. And if you think about, if you ever wanna understand the benefit of trees, go somewhere like in East LA where you can go to a city and drive for miles and not see a single tree and you'll see the impact. Um, it will just be blisteringly hot, particularly during the summer, there's no shade um, you definitely miss the beauty that the trees provide. And of course, as assets, there are a lot of, um, just a lot of value for trees. They can, they actually, a lot of studies that they reduce crime, they can slow traffic. They obviously provide the shade canopy. Um, they raise your property values. They're a barrier against, um, you know, noise, against wind. And they're obviously, with climate change being a hot topic, um, trees do have a huge role in mitigating climate change. Um, so those are some of the ways in which, you know, we, we try to promote wellness in the community. Um, it's a lot of physical activities and a lot of just providing, making different, uh, different amenities available, different experiences available. So the experience could be a class where you're acquiring a skill like tennis lessons. It could be, if you're a senior, it could simply be um, avoiding social isolation, getting out of the house going down to the senior center. Um, to that end, we provide transportation services to get you to the senior center. Um, we have nutrition services. Um, you know, it's, we have a congregate lunch program. That's where people go and they can socialize. Even during COVID, when that was shut down and we couldn't have that, um, we pivoted and worked with our community in the private sector to offer um, a drive-through lunch program. And we also did grocery deliveries. So we were really trying to 
offer, I guess, services to help people stay independent during a really trying time. One of the changes I've seen in parks and recreation departments is that they've gone from traditional parks and recreation, right, and just your sports orientation to trying to fill all of these other needs. Um, when I worked in the city of Santa Monica, we hosted a lot of social services on different days of the week in our park. We had a really heavy collaboration with the library where we were promoting literacy programs. Um, not every kid is into sports. Not every kid wants to go to the skate park. Some of those kids like to be in the chess club. Some of them like to go to the after school reading club at the library. So we're really trying, trying to do our best to collaborate, um, you know, maximize our resources, reduce the duplication of services and, you know, maximize those benefits for the community. Um, the other thing I was gonna say, and I'll just sort of wrap up with this, during the COVID crisis, I think if there's one thing that we've learned that across the country, parks and recreation departments and just community centers in general really became a central focal point um, for a lot of social services and just support services. Um, you know, I cited as an example, some of the nutrition programs that we offered for seniors in the city of San Dimas. A lot of, um, a lot of cities did that. And if you have a central place where people feel like they're part of the community, you can promote your services and people will come to you when they really need them. And that's something that we saw uh, during the COVID crisis. I think every, every city felt that. Um, so that, that's my thumbnail sketch, kind of the Cliff Notes version of a, what could be a really lengthy presentation. Um, but I do wanna leave time for Amanda and leave time for questions that we may have. Yes, yes, thank you so much for that, that big picture overview. Um, we'll shift over to Amanda, because I think a lot of questions are going to be uh, answerable by both of our presenters tonight. So um, Amanda, if you're uh, changing locations and getting settled. <laughs> No, 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 that's okay. That's okay. Um, we did have a few people just log on. So I want to say thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're shifting from the presentation from uh, the director of parks and recs from the city of San Dimas to uh, the community services department at the city of Laverne. Um, Ms. Amanda, we're so lucky to have her joining us as well. Um, if you have any questions or thoughts, go ahead and drop them into the chat. Um, and then we'll have a facilitated dialogue after um, Amanda shares a bit about what Laverne has to offer. <laughs> Hi there, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, perfect. I am so sorry. I was in a much nicer room and now I had to change location. So I apologize, but the internet is better in here. And I do have a PowerPoint. Um, is there any way that I can share that? Oh, here we go, share screen. Here we go. I don't do this very often, so I apologize. Uh, does everyone see the PowerPoint? Okay, perfect. So yes, my name is Amanda Triai and I work for the city of Laverne. I am the community services specialist and um, I've been with Laverne for about five years now. And I started as a recreation leader, moved over to a clerical assistant, to an administrative clerk, and now I'm the community services specialist, um, all within the same department. And so um, I will definitely go over each of the programs that I think are, are relate to wellness. Um, and I just wanted to show you guys first that According to the dictionary, wellness is the quality or state of being in good health, especially as an actively sought goal. Um, and I also think that wellness not, um, can also mean, you know, mental wellness, um, emotional wellness, that uh, peace of mind of having programs and uh, services to rely on. So Moving forward, um, I want to discuss the various programs that the City of Laverne offers um, and what our vision is and how community mem members can get involved with us and the programs we do offer. So I'll get started. Um, so the City of Laverne, we have various programs, but I thought I would focus on some of our more prevalent 
programs, which involves a lot of seniors, adults with disabilities, and um, I'll go over the general community after that. So um, for seniors, we offer a ton of free classes through Mount San Antonio uh, College, and they're held Monday through Friday, and it includes art, fitness, and technology courses. And I think that's really important to offer all of these things to our senior community. Um, not only are they a big demographic in Laverne, but they just seem to be the people that really, really need the resources and help. Um, so we also offer um, free senior seminar series and that is various Wednesdays and Fridays throughout the month. Um, and actually not even all of them are geared towards seniors. For example, we're gonna have two disaster preparedness courses at the end of the year. So really anyone can join that and just take note and be prepared just in case we're in the event of a disaster, but knock on wood, hopefully that doesn't happen. And um, we have, and again, all of these activities are pretty much free or just like a really nominal, like a small donation of 50 cents that goes back towards senior programming. So we can think of new classes and think of new programs to offer to our senior community. So um, like our senior movie matinees, those are free as well. And that's every second Monday of the month. Uh, we offer line dancing. That's a really popular course. And there's uh, games that seniors play within our community center, such as Senior Pinochle, Bridge, and Bingo. Um, we also do offer events that are either at a really small price or free. So our senior dinner dances not only include live music, um, dinner and wine. Uh, there's also activities, photo opportunities, and it's really fun time for the seniors. And that uh, we only charge $10 per senior. The holiday luncheon is free and we have the Benita High School Chamber singers typically singing for them throughout the event and uh, having pictures of Santa. And more along the general wellness line, we have the health fair and flu shot clinic. And um, really anyone can participate in that as well too. And we have various organizations that come through and offer health screenings. And um, typically we do distribute flu shots as well. I have been having issues getting them this year. Um, I know the Claremont Senior Center is offering that with their health fair as well. So if you are looking for a facility that is offering flu shots, um, Claremont is offering that this year. Although I am trying to get my hands on them too. So I'll keep you guys updated with that. And then um, as uh, Scott mentioned, there are services, um, transportation services for our seniors, such as the get about buses and they serve the Claremont, Laverne, Pomona and San Dimas area. Sorry if that got cut off. Um, but there's also dial a ride. There's many of other services that can um, help seniors get transported from place to place. Um, we also offer a senior gas pumping program and seniors, and it's free. They just have to call the community center and we'll give them a red placard. And um, I know Vons does it and a couple of the Shell gas stations on Foothill Boulevard in Laverne. So they, um, you just have to call the gas station and they'll come and pump the gas for you. So that's a nice service for the seniors that maybe have trouble getting in and out of their car. Um, we also offer AARP tax preparation programs and that's actually available to low income individuals as well, not just seniors. So um, that starts about February every year and goes up until April. Um, last year due to the pandemic, we did extend it through like May. So um, we'll definitely see what happens this year. Um, we also offer free legal services for um, seniors and that's every fourth Friday. So in fact, tomorrow we're gonna have, um, so we used to have Howard Hawkins. Now we have Anna Valiente Gomez and she will see people in 20 minute increments um, every fourth Friday from 11, 10 to 12. So that's six sessions that she's here for. Uh, then we have meal services. Again, like Scott had said, we have a nutrition program. It was previously curbside, but that has just changed actually today to a pick up and go system. 
So we'll see how that turns out. Um, some of the seniors aren't very happy with it, but we had to make the change due to having some of our Mount SAC classes back. Um, so we'll see how that goes, but there's also Meals on Wheels that serves the Liver and San Dimas area. Those meals are $5, um, but they'll drop off the meals um, to the seniors that want to utilize that program. And there's also the critical delivery service that um, you're just called 211. And I think you are able to get a certain amount of meals every month but I can look into that for you, but that's the one I'm not as familiar with, but it is another service. And, um, and this kind of goes back into uh, how to get the community involved as well too. We have volunteer opportunities for seniors, but some of these actually uh, also, we could take help from younger individuals. They don't have to be older adults. For example, the nutrition program, I think, especially as the uh, kind of like pick up and go program it is now, we would need the help of younger individuals. Um, we actually brought our senior volunteers back today to test it out. And I think that it's a little too, um, it's just not like it was when we had the congregate meals. So I'm not sure if they're able to pack as quickly or able to move as much as we did when we were doing the program. So if anybody would like to volunteer, any high schoolers, any college kids, anybody, we would gladly take them every Thursday for a few hours for the lunch program. Um, other than that, yeah, our seniors love to volunteer. Um, they volunteer through Yana, You're Not Alone. It's like a more peer-to-peer -peer program that actually stems from RSVP2, our Retired Senior Volunteer Patrol uh, group. And you'll often see them at events as well too. So it's our older adult um, volunteers. And Aging Next is a whole another organization that we partner with and I made a whole slide for them. Um, they're great, they're based in Claremont and they have other services as well for seniors. So. There's Ride and Go volunteer driver programs, um, the Aging Next volunteers just in general, maybe they, they would uh, interview you just to see what qualities you'd have that would go along with um, particular seniors needs. And then there's care partners, um, like a peer-to-peer -peer program again, where seniors would uh, just provide services to those that are homebound. Um, and again, they're based in Claremont. We use them very often. And moving on, uh, our next uh, group or demographic that we provide services to as well is adults with disabilities. We have Mount SAC classes um, that are free too. And there's two uh, courses, lifelong learning and computer skill classes. So I just think that's another great way to get um, adults with disabilities out and just out and about promoting that wellness and giving them skills that they could use outside of uh, just in the world. Um, and we hold events for them as well. So we, uh, we do, it's just dances at the moment. So Sweethearts Dance, uh, the Luau Dance in August and the Halloween Hop in October, which is the most popular dance out of the three. Um, and kind of speaking to what Scott had said earlier, um, I think cities do tend to get in a rut sometimes where we just follow what we've done in years past. And this particular group, I am, I do oversee the inclusion advisory committee. So I would love, just recently, um, I just got this position in April, but I would love to oversee or just, um, spearhead or implement like just newer programming for these adults with disabilities because we've been doing this for years and I think it's just time to change things up um I'm possibly I haven't even talked with my director about this was thinking about having like a movie night where we have the lights down low and the captions on and the sound isn't too loud and maybe we work with sponsors and have pizza or just just something different to mix it up um and so that's pretty much what we offer for adults with disabilities. And for the general community, um, we do work with Tri-City who work with Claremont, Laverne and Pomona to deliver um, a bunch of 
mental health uh, resources. And I thought this would be um, a good topic to talk about since we're talking about wellness and just like having that emotional and mental wellness uh, services and programs too, not just like physical and um, fitness geared. So Tri-City offers um, a ton of different services. Right now, some of the in-person services are through their community navigators and uh, their peer mentor program. So really the difference between those two is that the community navigators are licensed and the peer mentors are just that. They're, it's like a peer-to-peer -peer program. Um, and, and it really provides more emotional support than anything, while the community navigators have the resources to get you food, um, maybe shelter for a little while, can put you in a homeless um, shelter if needed. Um, additionally, they have a wellness center where you can look for jobs. Um, they have activities. Unfortunately, um, they're all virtual right now, but they used to have in-person classes. And uh, the same thing with community gardening. Um, that is virtual too, where they teach you the ins and outs of gardening over Zoom, but um, they used to have a garden where you can actually do it, learn to garden, grow, and actually pick from that garden too. Um, and then there's a supplemental crisis services, which is basically a hotline. And I think it might be cut off, but those hours um, are late. They run from 8 to 4 a.m. Um, if you, and it's just for those that are feeling down, um, want someone to talk to, maybe are stressed, overwhelmed, you can call that hotline and uh, they will provide the support or the ear that you need. And um, that is about it. But I am hoping for Laverne um, that we just get more volunteers, get the community involved, um, start new programs. We are building a teen center at some point. So I think that will really boost our sports programming as that has been a little bit of a rut as well. It's just been kind of flatlined the same for years. I think it's time to bring something new. So I think once this team center is built, it's gonna be something really special for the community. And that's gonna be at Las Flores Park right next to Benita High School and the Aquatic Center. Um, and that's it, that's all I have to say. It was a lot. I'm really sorry for taking up so much time, but- No, no, that was great. That was really, really great. Um, yeah. <laughs> My first I, presentation, I, so. I, I love it. I think uh, getting this kind of overview conceptually and um, and and specifically, it, it helps help us navigate this conversation forward. So there's a couple of questions in the chat that I for sure want to highlight. Um, oh and then I also would love to uh, discuss with each of you what challenges that we see. And I don't know um, who can stop the screen share so we can go back to this grid view. I don't know if Matt, if you have the power to do that or if Amanda needs to stop oh, something. Yeah, I'll do the stop share. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay. Um, but real quick, Amanda, a question because Isabel asked it and I'm really excited about it. Um, mm -hmm. When is the teen center? Is there a timeline on um, that teen center being built? And then also Scott had mentioned the community service needs assessment. Is that something that you're aware of Laverne uh, has done or does regularly or um, can you speak to either of those? I will do my best right now. So, you know, and I would love, I can put my email in the chat and number. Um, I believe I had heard the timeline for the teen center. Um, it may take about five years uh, for this to come to fruition. That is what I've heard but I have no problem at all if you guys were to email me or give me a call and I will ask um, my director, sorry, my director. Um, okay, got it, sorry. <laughs> so I will ask my director, Yvonne Duran, um, all the details of that, but I believe I heard it's gonna take about five years for that to come to fruition. Um, also the community services needs assessment. I think it's something we need to do. I put out a survey through SurveyMonkey to our seniors during the height of this pandemic. Um, and I assessed what needs they felt they needed. So we actually incorporated like a 
Zoom 101, how to use Zoom, um, and um, just having our rec leaders calling them to make sure that they're fine. We just we just tried our best to work with what we could do, given that we weren't open and we couldn't see them. So I put that out, but I think that's a great idea. Um, I'm definitely actually I'm taking note of that now. I think it'd be great if we did a community services needs assessment. And and on that and, same uh, fact, no, I um, don't know. And, oh, go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say, and on that same fact of um, a needs assessment or getting better um, feedback and uh, integration with the community. Um, Scott, the question was asked, what would be the best way for a community member to get involved in that process um, as, as far as providing their own feedback and ensuring that um, however that need assessment takes place, that it, it's comprehensive for the entire community? You know, thank you for the question. Um, let me take the second part first. So how do, you, how do you make sure that you're doing a good job and being thorough when you're doing a needs assessment? Um, you, what we did is we hired, we hired RJM Design Group and they're, they are landscape architects. They design a lot of parks and facilities, um, but they also do a lot of park master planning. And when I say we hired them, that was actually before I joined the city of San Dimas. But coincidentally, I've worked with them in other cities and they're outstanding. And typically what they do is they basically reach out to the community. Um, Amanda mentioned surveys, which are a great way to get people to provide information. You can do surveys online. You can hand out surveys right after special events or after classes and ask people just a whole range of questions. Um, there tends to be a lot of small group discussion in the community outreach. So for example, if you're talking about a specific facility or a specific park um, or a specific type of service, you're going to want to have that meeting at a specific facility. Um, and that's, that's usually how you do that. Um, in my experience, the way you know that you're being really thorough is when you start hearing the same things over and over and over in the different groups, through the surveys, through the, you know, the Zoom meetings, through the small group discussions, from, you know, through the, the Community Services Commission or the Parks and Recreation Commission, when you start hearing a lot of the same issues and needs come up that are expressed by the residents, that's when you know that you've, you've kind of hit a saturation point. And I forget, I forget the other part of the question. Um, what would be the best way for a resident to get involved? Hmm. Got it. Um, so, you know, what? We, before I joined the city, they had already completed this needs assessment, but the, the program is ongoing. So we have information and data um, that RJM Design Group is gonna present at our next Parks and Recreation Commission meeting. I would say get involved with the Parks and Recreation Commission, um, start attending the meetings, um, or at least go at, at the time. I know our next meeting's September 21st, and we will have a presentation on that needs assessment. Um, the following meeting, we'll probably have a presentation from staff on our strategic plan, which is sort of us saying, taking all this information, making sense out of it, and then explaining within the confines of the resources that we have, this is how we can implement what we heard and maximize our resources to meet the needs of the community that were expressed uh, during the needs assessment. Um, that's one way. And then I, I, that's probably the best way actually is the Community Services or Parks and Recreation Commission. Good, cool. And Amanda, similarly, is, is it the same situation over on the Laverne side? As far as what would be the best way for a community member who wanted to be involved in you know this process vision construction and an actual implementation right i would keep track of um city council meetings if there's anything that you ever wanted to know maybe a specific topic like you wanted to learn more about the teen center um don't hesitate to shoot me an email give me a call and i will find out when that's going to be posted on the city council's agenda um and just start attending those meetings or um, if you'd like to volunteer at our center, we would really appreciate it. <laughs> um, and just getting involved that way in the community. Good, good. Um, and now I want to I want to shift the conversation a little bit to challenges because we actually had a couple of questions that came up. Um, identifying or asking how um, different challenges are, are handled. One of them, um, Chris brought up the 
uh, the disproportionate impact of COVID on both the elderly and younger people. Um, and that even prior to COVID, those were two populations that um, are more susceptible to loneliness and things like that. Um, and the, the idea of, is there ever any opportunity for us to pair those groups together in some sort of way, right? Right now it would probably need to be virtual. Um, but I know we've seen of different uh, programs that either have some sort of like mentorship and mentee or like, you know, a volunteer program at the home. Is, is there anything like that happening or in the pipeline? And if not, how might Chris get involved in making that happen? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give that one a thought. I mean, the, the, the very short answer is we don't have that at the moment. Um, however, um, one of the things that came up for seniors, there's a whole new group of baby boomers. We call them the younger seniors. Um, you know, so 60 is the new 30. And these are seniors. If you went to a senior center 20 years ago, you were talking about seniors who were in their, you know, their 70s and 80s and, and you saw a lot of bingo and nothing but bingo. Um, as Amanda mentioned, our, our program is really very similar. It's a lot of, it's really all focused around wellness now. I mean, you have all the health discussions, all the health screenings, um, you have the tax assistance, the transportation programs, the nutrition. We really have very similar programs. Um, but you know, your, your question was about pairing youth uh, with older adults. Um, we can look at that. I don't know if that came up as a real theme in San Dimas, although I know that broadly volunteerism came up, which is something that Amanda also mentioned. Um, and older seniors have, well, older seniors, seniors have just so much to offer as volunteers because they have so much experience and knowledge about their communities. So that's something that um, pretty much any city would like to tap into. And if I could just veer from the question for a minute, I think that there's an important, you know, you talk about the challenges um, to achieving wellness and you talk about the disproportionate impact on COVID on, on certain groups, um, that's absolutely right. So the main challenges that I see, you know, in parks and recreation and all the services that Amanda and I provide, um, there are financial barriers. And the main, you know, the main issue there is gonna be equal access to recreation programs and facilities. Um, our city is very good. If you, there are some large cities where if you go, um, you can see that all the trees are planted in one side of the city, but not necessarily the lower income side of the city. All of the really good new parks are in one side of the city. All of the older parks uh, that you know haven't been updated in, in decades are in another part of the city. Now that, that's not happening in San Dimas, but that's something to watch for because it's a real equity issue. Um, the income spectrum, um, as parks and recreation departments, we offer public recreation and programs and services for the masses. People that have money um, have more opportunities. Um, Maybe I can put my kid in, in recreation ball, right, with the city and it's inexpensive and everyone plays and the skill level is not really high, but we have a lot of fun. Um, if I have money, I can put my son in sports clinics. I can take them to private gyms. I can pay for private coaching. I can get them on a travel ball team that's tryouts only. I mean, there are simply more opportunities for recreation and wellness. Um, if you have more resources. And that's something that I think every city is trying to, trying to level the, pardon the pun, right? Level the playing field on that. Mm -hmm. um, Amanda touched on developmental barriers. Um, one of the things, and they're doing great, you're doing great work there, Amanda. One of the things that I think every parks department is trying to do is develop more, we call them all ability facilities and programs. Um, so an example would be if you build a new program I'm sorry, if you build a new playground, um, we would probably make it to look like an all access playground. The old term used to be a handicap accessible playground. We call it an all access program or playground rather. And it's literally a playground. It's got uh, the expensive playground foam surfacing. You can roll a wheelchair out there. Everything is spaced out so that whether you're in a wheelchair or you're not in a wheelchair, you can access all of you know, the, the gadgets and the, the, the gizmos and the equipment. Um, that's an example of what that is. And then also there would be a ramp. You probably can't see what I'm doing with my hand here. Um, there's a ramp where kids can run up or if you're in a wheelchair, 
you can roll up that, you can roll across a bridge, you can roll down the other side. That's an example of kind of a, a breaking down some physical barriers with recreation amenities. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last one I would say would just be social isolation. And I think Amanda touched on that also. Um, anything you can do, it's not just about recreation, anything you can do to help seniors with their nutritional needs. Um, if you give them transportation programs, they don't just get to the senior center um, to enjoy you know, socializing and programs. They can continue with their activities of daily living, which are things like going out and going shopping, going to the bank, going to visit family. Um, think about how much of your independence is tied to your transportation and your ability to get out and do the things that you need to do. Um, so just those are some of the barriers. I think there are financial barriers, I, I think um, physical barriers and just resources, making sure that all of your recreation programs and facilities are available equally to everyone. That's great. That's great. And Laverne uh, just put in an ex uh, all I was abilities. I just going to say that right yeah. next to La Forest Park. Yeah, all access. Super nice, nearly brand new, just opened. Um, it's great. I'm glad. I hope we're able to put more of those in. I know it's they're expensive, but maybe just over time, we'll slowly have more uh, all access equipment. Mm -hmm. And then, and then Scott, you mentioned, um, I don't know if it was tied to the assessment, um, but you, you, you mentioned just the, the organizational requirement to ensure that you're minimizing duplication of services. Um, and someone in the chat also asked um, how much communication is there between um, even the different programs within the city, as well as what may be offered by, you know, businesses, organizations, and nonprofits in the city or nearby, how much network has been done to how much networking has been done to minimize that duplication of services, not just within the city um, department, but just within the cities at large? You know, that's a great question. So there is a great deal of collaboration in the city of San Dimas and I'm, I'm really proud of that. And it's not because I built it, it was there when I got there. Um, we, we collaborate well with the school district, which is incredibly rare. I mean, a lot of cities just don't have that positive relationship. Um, and there's a lot of potential um, I think that that relationship more than any is where you, you, you work out joint use facility agreements, joint programming, joint operation of certain types of programs. And, and again, I've only been here about three months, but those are some things that we're going to be exploring with the school district. Um, we also have tremendous support from the business community and the Chamber of Commerce. Um, that is not necessarily true in every community. And I know that when Prior to my arrival in San Dimas, when we had the program where we had the drive-through lunch program um, and the program where we would deliver groceries and, and important items to seniors at home who are isolated, that was all. I mean, that was a private public partnership. And there were a lot of organizations that were involved in that. Um, so a lot of that's going on within the city. Um, as far as the collaboration between the cities, my sense is that, you know, as in recreation, we don't do that as much, but I think that cities on a different level, they do a lot of that because a lot of the issues that cities tend to face um, tend to be regional in nature, right? So you, things like law enforcement or um, pollution or um, you know, crime task forces, things like that, there's a lot, tends to be a lot of collaboration um, at a higher level. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, so, I think two of the great challenges, one of them that you mentioned was um, finances, right? We had a question, are there grants available? I mean, there are certainly grants available. Are there people that are actively pursuing applying for those grants um, for all access um, amenities? And then also how much of the financial cost could be mitigated by um, more creative manpower. Um, Amanda mentioned like, what about like, are there arts and crafts things? Uh, that's an opportunity to link together young people and old people. Um, real quick, I'll share a story during the, um, the deepest of deepest of the COVID lockdown, I reached out to uh, Hillcrest because there was this booming rock painting club in San Dimas. And I'm like, I want to get 
rocks in senior communities and have them be able to paint these rocks and then go like we'll be able to collect people to go hide them and then kids can hide those rocks and then they post them to social media and I just had that but like they're just and they said like yeah of course make it happen you know um and, and I can't make 18 million things happen at the same time Amanda maybe you can make that happen though um but I'm wondering is it the grants that we must pursue? Is it getting volunteers who are energized to contribute to something like that? How do we how do we facilitate moving those balls forward? Amanda, do you want to answer first? Sure. I I hate like relying on this crutch because I'm new to the position, but I definitely want to look into that. I know I have looked into grants in regards to like the beautification of certain areas, maybe areas that need more plants, or we can get senior is a community involved in like a community garden, which we actually do have one at um, the Church Heritage of the Brethren. Park. Oh my God, there's one there too. Look at that. You know, there's one at, there's one at Laverne Heritage Park. That's really, really cute. Um, but I would just like to kind of update the community center. We have a patio that I think can use some beautification and then a back patio and uh, get our gardening club involved in the gardening class for seniors. Um, but yes, that is something that I'm gonna look into. I wrote it down, grants for um, all access communities. Um, but yeah, I think just getting people involved or sponsors, getting the word out um, will also help too, but I will look into grants for sure. I don't I mean, know if Scott has any, maybe Scott, more- Scott, anything out of that? With that and maybe can lend me a hand on resources. Well, well, we can talk. So I'm still learning about all the grants. We actually have several grants. Um, there are some grants we're using to plant trees as part of our urban forest, urban forestry program. Um, those are really good. We also have grants. I know that we use um, our senior excursions, all of the transportation funds, right? So you do that too. Yes. Um, all the transportation funds are generally paid by Prop A funds. So that greatly reduces our expenses, which magnifies um, the scope of services that we can offer. Um, so there are grants out there. The, the thing you need to remember about grants is that grants are great if they fit into something that you are already going to do. If it's consistent with something in your strategic plan, it's really easy just to chase the money and start building things and, and paying for things and if you do that without a strategic vision and where it's not part of like a coherent plan that's well well thought out um you some of those programs may not be sustainable and you know they can just be hit or miss when they're strategic they tend to be more sustainable okay. because you this have a lot of community buy-in um and there's just there's more behind it it's consistent with other things that you're doing all of your resources are sort of pointing in the same direction which increases the chance that it's gonna maximize the benefits to the community. Awesome, thank you so much. <laughs> um, and then I think we have, that's the last chat uh, question that I see, um, but it looks like we have a question. Amanda, I think your hand was raised first. So we'll go to Amanda and then Joseph, and then I will give Amanda, uh, Amanda from the city of Laverne. So Amanda Lee, your question, then Joseph Lyons, your question, and then I'll give um, Amanda from Laverne and Scott from Sandy Miss uh, closing words. So I just had a quick question because I know like within the city government itself is very complicated when it comes to having these programs because there's a lot of making sure you have the money to back up the programs. You know, there can be a ton of ideas, but having to find that money is the complicated part and then you have to actually go through the process of suggesting it and getting approval but um i i know i had mentioned again the painting and stuff because something that i have noticed um and scott i really like that you brought up that we do have this especially in san dimas i don't live in laverne so i'm not sure about there but in san dimas we do have younger seniors that kind of um don't like the concept that, you know, hey, I'm not old, so I don't need to go do bingo. That's an old person thing, or I don't need this service because I'm capable to go do it. So they might resist taking advantage of those programs. So that's where I was looking more at like, you know, paint night stuff, because I see a lot of my um, 
a lot of seniors that are like my mom's age who are, she's what, turned 60 this year. Um, and they prefer to do like wine, you know, wine and paint night things. And I know the winery on Bonita actually hosts those. Um, it's not with the city, but it is a winery. They do host those. Or um, they've even suggested like um, doing story time for pre-K students where the seniors are the one that are doing that. So is it possible to use, you know, social media to reach the younger people to kind of start to build up this or build up, you know, volunteers and stuff? Because I think that's where a lot of cities are struggling as well. So, um, you know, so again, new programs for the younger seniors and then utilizing social media perhaps to make people aware of the program because I didn't know you, you know, San Dimas or Laverne had a lot of those programs at all. Um, I know older seniors may not use social media as much, but well, I'm, I'm 34. So Facebook is for old people now too, I guess. But, um, you know, it's just utilizing the new social media to generate interest in that kind of stuff. So I guess that was kind of my comment or question. So thank you again for your presentation. It was really great to hear about that, by the way. You know, if I could, there was a lot in there. So first I can say we're at, we actually are looking at, um, I think we're calling it a paint and sip class. We're looking at that. I don't know why that is. You add alcohol, alcohol to any activity and it becomes a really fun recreational activity, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's something that we're looking at. We also have, if you're familiar with the senior center, in San Dimas, we have an art room. And eventually, um, I hope to renovate that in a way that makes the space more usable. Um, but you're spot on with the art classes. We're looking at that. We heard a lot of that in the needs assessment. Um, the, let me address something else that you brought up, which is just the challenge of, of offering programs and services. So it, it is funding. So, but there are things that we can do about that. Something that you've seen um, there's a trend in cities, probably across the nation, I know definitely in California, where the real buzzword is cost recovery, and that means fees. So programs that used to be offered free of charge, um, now we're calculating what it actually costs to provide, you know, to make these services and programs available to the community, or what it actually costs to offer a recreation center and staff it and operate it and maintain it and make it available to the community. And we're starting to adjust our fees to correspond more closely with those expenses. Um, I don't expect anything to get, and most things won't get to 100% cost recovery. Um, but the goal, right, on that equation of there's money that you spend from the general fund, and then there's money that you bring in. And in recreation, they're usually not equal, but we're trying to increase that so that we, we continue you know, to have programs and services that are more sustainable in the future. That's one of the ways that we do that. The other way that we can do that is looking at other, other models of um, providing services. And that's, I mean, that's really thinking out of the box. Um, but you know what, just an example of that would be, I keep referencing the transportation services that we offer to our seniors. Um, we don't actually offer that. We don't, we don't pay for that. That's actually a regional service we just link our residents to that. We make them aware of it, we market it, we steer them towards it, and that's how they get accustomed to using it. So that's kind of an example of what resources do we, do we have that are gonna provide more services to people and not increase the cost of the city. Um, but by and large, one of the things that the needs assessment accomplishes as we start to discuss it and flesh it out is it takes all of these needs that were expressed and we start to prioritize and we start to prioritize in a way that makes sense for our city. That may look different than it does for Laverne or for you know, Glendora or Azusa um, because every city is, is special, every city is unique. Um, but that's kind of the goal is that we can't offer, we can't meet all of those needs. Let's figure out what the priorities are and then what we can do uh, to provide as much as we can. Yeah. and. Um... 
on that, I mean, Amanda mentioned, what about partnership with like the local clubs, the local organizations, like how much is the women's club involved or the Rotary or Masons or, um, you know, whatnot. I think, I, I mean, you, you mentioned, I mean, collaborative governance is, is ha it has to become the trend, right? Because we can't accomplish nearly as much if we're working in silos. And um, when there's duplicative efforts, then everybody's impact is decreased. Um, so I, I don't know if, if you all have a, a, a tool or something that can, can increase the amount of networking that is done, or do you think that's something that the cities, cities do quite well? Mm, I, I can, so for Laverne at least, I know we're really trying to utilize um, social media as best as possible. We just, um created an instagram um we utilize facebook quite a bit and i'm um, speaking to what amanda l was saying earlier um i do notice that at least for laverne it seems like we have not like the the newer older adults we have a lot of the older um adult seniors within the laverne demographic um so I would say that social media does reach the younger audiences that we are looking for, but in regards to the older people that seem to be the most um, active within the center, our senior newsletter, just like printing it out, having it on the counter, getting people through, mailing it to the mobile home parks, that's been the best way for us to reach at least our most like prevalent population. Um, and just sorry to go back to what Amanda was saying, we do actually have uh, watercolor classes, drawings, so just to put like a plug on our classes, and um, those are provided through Mount Sac, and you can, you don't have to be a Laverne resident. I've had people from um, Eastvale and Ontario come to our classes, so please feel free to stop by, come to the center, grab a newsletter, um, see what other programs we offer, and yeah, sorry if I went backtrack, but anyway, I don't know if Scott has anything to say on <laughs> I, I actually do, and I know I know we're running out of time here, but Amanda, we there's something that we should both highlight that we're both doing that that is really innovative, I think. So we both have classes from Mount Sac. Mount Sac, everybody wins, right? The classes are free for our residents. The classes are free for the city. We don't have to pay for those. We just provide the facility. Yes. They come and teach the classes. We get highly qualified instructors who provide really good instruction to our seniors. Um, I mean, it's win-win all the way around. And then what's in it for the college is that they get the outreach into the community. Um, that's a great example of maximizing the resources around us and collaborating with another organization where it makes sense to do so. And it's, it's I mean, it's huge. That's where, I'm assuming Laverne's the same as, as San Dimas where that's where all of our really good fitness classes come from. So yes. exercise band classes. Um, chair Open exercise it. classes Balance, right yeah. exactly right all of those very popular right. tai chi yeah yeah that's great and i think both of you mentioned interactions and engagement with the chamber of commerce so i would assume that would be another opportunity i think many of those clubs and organizations have representation on the chamber of commerce um and and stuff can happen there um let's go ahead and get to uh joseph lyon's question and then we can give each of our panelists their their final thoughts uh, thank you. Uh, I think this is a, a tremendous opportunity, again, with new people uh, sitting in positions that allow them to perhaps not to be anchored to the past, that uh, one, uh, and I, I really appreciate the, uh, the need to have a strategic plan uh, that you're uh, working towards, but it seems, uh, I think you referenced uh, the need to kind of break from the past and see cooperative governance and, and, and integrated governance. And this is one of those areas that is, I think, ideally suited for that, in that uh, the programs that are being offered are already being accessed by multiple uh, uh, people from multiple communities. They know what's going on everywhere and, and, and seek. But to actually intentionally build a uh, a cooperative arrangement in park and recreation facilities. And more importantly, even with that, because that's a multi-governmental um, uh, partnership, but bringing in, as everybody has mentioned, the private sector, because I think they're in the private public uh, uh, 
granting opportunities are increasing significantly. Everybody is looking for a community engagement piece outside of the governmental agency's interests. So I just encourage, again, the strategic planning that sees the fact that, you know, when you go across the foothills and you connect uh, Laverne, San Dimas and Claremont, uh, you may have a stretch of five, six miles, okay? It's, it's, a, it's a medium sized city when you put them all together no need to duplicate the kinds of um, administrative uh, uh, kind of uh, needs that each independent program has if you can combine them. And I think that is a, a window of opportunity that uh, is provided, unfortunately, by both COVID, but by, I think, uh, now that we, you have enthusiastic new faces, uh, they can bring that uh, to their respective boards. But I applaud uh, the, the enthusiasm that's been demonstrated. But again, thinking outside the box, I think, is, is, the, uh, is the winner. Uh, and cooperation and, and collaboration among cities and private, uh, the private sector is the way to go for uh, more uh, successful grant applications. So thank you for letting me share that. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely agree. Um, if we can have Amanda and Scott go ahead and I, I thank you so much for for coming on. I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation um, and always wish that they could go on for a whole nother hour. Um, but if you want to go ahead and give any last words or thoughts that you have um, and then we can move on to club business. Sure. I'll, I'll sign or say my goodbye first. Um, so Yes, wellness when it comes to the city of Laverne, like we, like I had mentioned, just that um, it's not only just like physical activity, but it's also just emotional wellness, um, having the resources and accessibility to services and programs. And I like what had, what Scott had mentioned earlier about um, just that, uh, uh, oh my goodness, you had mentioned a divide uh, between communities maybe like that may have more money or maybe other areas that don't have as many and just making sure that we have programs that are available to all or that we can meet at that level of, um, I don't know, I guess the, the more expensive quality of programming, um, but make sure that's accessible to everyone. Uh, so that's definitely our goal moving forward and just trying new things and new programming as time changes, rolling with the punches, adapting to COVID, this pandemic. Um, I know it was mentioned earlier, uh, bridging the youth with the seniors. I thought it was a really cool idea that was in the chat of having maybe like seniors helping the youth where Laverne has had a lot of the youth helping the seniors in regards to technology, Zoom 101 learning how to use their own cell phone. Um, we did have that program when we did have volunteers. Um, we are lacking in the volunteer area at the moment. So I do uh, strongly encourage the community, if you know of anyone that is willing to volunteer their time, even just for a few hours, I would love to work with you um, so we can just provide these programs and services to the community. Um, and that, that is it for me um, signing off from the city of Laverne, but I'll be here for, you know, Scott's goodbye and the end of this presentation. But that was all from the community services department from Laverne. So thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And I loved hearing from you, Scott. You're really knowledgeable. And I took down a lot of notes. Uh, thank you so much. And, and you did an amazing job uh, representing Laverne um, call me anytime I can, I can help with something. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, I just, and I, I really appreciate getting the opportunity to speak to the club also. Um, it's an interesting conversation and it's something that's really important to me, particularly all those issues of, of, you know, equitability in recreation programming and, and facilities that that's really important to Amanda too. So, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to present tonight. And uh, what you can look for in the future from San Dimas, I know we have our needs assessment coming up and we have our, uh, our strategic plan. And the last thing I'll add, the strategic plan is more than just the programming. This is what we heard. This is what we're gonna offer. A lot of it has to do with asset management. So all of the facilities that, that we operate in both of our cities, 
um, take a lot of money to maintain and, and keep up to standard. And I'm in the process of developing an asset management plan with staff um, to ultimately share with the city council so that we can project all of our capital needs, you know, three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years. Um, so it's a huge task, but that's really, I feel like it's the core of the strategic plan because that's, that's where a lot of the money goes. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. And either way, I know it's um, San Dimas is going to be on really strong footing. Sounds like Laverne is on really strong footing. So uh, I've enjoyed presenting tonight. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I want to like dive into that inequitability even within our own communities um, much deeper another time. I actually, I mean, it. it I would love for it to become clear to community members that like inequity exists within our own communities. Um, a lot of, especially with both cities discussing going towards districts for council representation and for school board representation. Um, I've heard some people bring up the point, like, why is that necessary? Like we're all this same community and like, as if everything's the same. Um, and I am left wondering why are there more trees in one part of town and less trees in the other side of town. Why is it that on some walks I go on, depending on what type of town and the sidewalks just don't connect and I'm left like off-roading with my stroller, you know? Um, and if there's no one in the room to ask that question when the decision is being made, then what we've always done continues to be what we always do. Um, and I think that's an important conversation to be had. So maybe we'll have to invite you both on to continue this further. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Scott and Amanda. We're going to go ahead and stop the um, recording for the presentation. Um, and then we can, um, I will 